you've started an amazing podcast that we mentioned a few times. Uh, people should definitely check it out. Uh, it's called the Huberman Lab Podcast. It uh, it does your. It's basically you. <laughs> it embodies the personality of Andrew Huberman, which is like make science accessible, um, but also uh, fascinating and giving it like. What, what do you call it? You give tools for everyday life, meaning it kind of grounds it in like, what the hell does this mean for my life? But then also does the beauty of science at the same time. So I love I love both the the rigor and the openness of the whole thing, plus the whole corrections things that we mentioned. Anyway, what's uh, been the hardest part of this whole process? You're one of, already one of the only, and one of the best science podcasters out there. So in that process, what's been the hardest, what's been the most exciting part? Oh, wow. Well, first of all, thanks for the kind words about the podcast. It was inspired by you. I you. I absolutely, it's, um, that's no BS. I The last time we met to do an interview for your podcast, we talked a little bit about it and you gave me the um, subtle nudge that maybe <laughs> there was a, there was a podcast there and I thought about it and I left and I was just like, I gotta do this thing. Yeah. And, and you really gave me the encouragement to do it. And I, your podcast, this podcast has really forged the way. You've been tip of the spear on serious, scientific, intellectual, yet fun, accessible conversation. And so I, as your colleague and friend and, but I just, even if Thank those you. things weren't true, like it, this this podcast was and is the inspiration. There's no Thank question. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really uh, like hundred percent. And when I decided to do the podcast, the Huberman Lab podcast, I thought really long and hard about what would work best and would be most beneficial. It turned out to be the hardest thing, which is to stay on a single topic for three or four or more episodes before switching to a new topic. Because I know from the experience of university and teaching in university, as you know as well, that there's always the temptation to pivot to something else, mm -hmm. but the drilling into something really deeply is where the where the gems reside. And the the challenge has been how to make it interesting, how to keep people on board, how to give people tools along the way, but also stay close to the scientific data. Um, I like to think that we're headed in the right direction. It still needs to evolve, but that's been a challenge. Uh, I think I also am challenged by the fact that there's a tremendous range of backgrounds of listeners. So some people have asked for more names, like more bits and parts of the nervous system and cellular molecular mechanisms mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. And other people have said, I don't understand any of that stuff, but I think I'm keeping up. And so unlike a university course where there are prerequisites and everyone's coming to the table with more or less the same knowledge, I have a very limited sense of what the audience knows and doesn't know. So that's why I incorporated the feature of the comment section on YouTube being a source of feedback. And I do a kind of an office hours like mm -hmm. episode every third or fourth episode where I address common questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that the podcast space in my mind, um, at least for the sort of podcast I'm doing, needed a venue for the listeners to be a more integral part of the experience as opposed to just commenting on what they liked or didn't like. So while I like to hear what people liked and didn't like, I also really like to hear about, hey, tell me more about temperature minimums and how they can be used to phase shift circadian rhythms or whatever it is. And I realized that I'm probably losing some people along the way, but hopefully at the end of each month, and because of the way that the episodes are archived, people will come away feeling as if they've learned a ton and they have tools that they can implement. And perhaps most importantly, that they're starting to think scientifically about the tons of other stuff that's out there. So that's been the challenge and it's still really early days, but, um, and, and of course, there's also an attentional challenge. I realize that people are busy. Not everyone has two hours to listen to a podcast about jet lag and shift work and raising kids and sleep and that kind of thing. I'm not raising kids, but I did a whole thing about babies and sleep with, you know, and how parents can manage their sleep when kids aren't sleeping. So it's been, um, I'm hacking through the jungle of all this stuff, but, and I'll come right back to, I, it, my inspiration and my, 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 uh, North star on this is getting to a point where the audience 
that listens to this feels the same way that I do when I listen to your podcast. Thank you so much. Like right. when I turn into your podcast, I'm gonna embarrass you a little bit more by complimenting you a little bit more, um, but not out of a sadistic uh, <laughs> thing, but just yeah. because when I tune into your podcast or Joe's podcast, I have the same sensation that other people have. Like, I feel like I'm home of sorts. I'm like, I'm familiar with the space and I'd like people to feel comfortable in the space that is the Huber and Lab podcast, whatever that ends up being. Yeah, that's the magic of podcasting. It's like, I feel like I'm part of your life now in a way that as a fan that I wouldn't be otherwise. And, you know, like I, I would, never was able to have that with Carl Sagan, for example, you know? Uh, and that's a whole nother level of connection with a human being that gets you excited. And then I share your excitement about uh, different topics in neuroscience or just uh, f biology in general. And then I don't have to actually understand everything you're saying to uh, to really enjoy it. So that that's the magic of podcasting is like, you can go through like 10 minutes and understanding what the hell a person is saying. And then you uh, enjoy the excitement and then you reconnect to a thing that you do understand what they're saying. And, you know, that's uh, the, that personal coupled with the scientific rigor is magic. And finding the right, it's exploration. Like uh, Joe found something that works for comedians, which is like, you know, having a good laugh, but also every once in a while talking seriously about difficult topics. The scientific space it, it was unclear. I, you haven't had guests on not yet, yet. but uh, maybe you'll come on as a. That's our first I'm, I was going to invite. My, I was going to try to force oh, myself I, in I, there. I am. <laughs> I'm officially inviting you now. Will you come on the podcast? I would as love a guest? to. I would Fantastic. Love to. It, but it was. It was hard. It's still a little bit difficult to tell people that no, you don't get it. We're not going to talk for ten minutes. We're going to talk for three or four hours. It's a different for scientists mm -hmm. for like, they're like, what, I, I don't, what are we going to talk about? And they think it's like the NPR interview. Yes. And they don't realize, first of all, I think at his best, if you're like at the level of Joe Rogan, who I think is an excellent conversationalist, it, it you just lose track of time. It can be three, four five hours and you lose track of time. I'm still not there. I find that it's still painful. Like the conversation is still challenging sometimes. You don't lose quite as much of track of time. It's still an intellectual effort. And I think it might always be as it would be with you because you're talking about difficult topics maybe that require more brain. You're not just shooting the shit with like a Brian Red Band or somebody like comedians or just joking. Well, it's like, uh, remember those shows, um, like where so those shows where someone would come out and like spin plates and they're running back and forth. And so really good scientific discussion is like that. You have to be maintaining three or four different logical arguments and jumping back and forth. It's occasionally get into like a real streak of linearity. Yeah. But as we found today that typically there's three or four different things that we're bouncing back yeah. and forth from. And that requires a lot of updating of these, you know, four brain circuits. It's not, it's not a passive listening experience, but I like to think that the brain likes that. I, I do want to ask the, just because we all, I don't want to forget the the question came up to me is your podcast has the same kind of rigor that I think like a Dan Carlin podcast has who's a history podcaster. Well, that's a definitely a compliment. Thank you. It I mean, feels Dan's, like, Dan's way, you know, he's something for me to aspire to. So he goes through hell to prepare. He spends months preparing. It feels like you've had to really prepare for your podcast. I definitely prepare hard. How yeah. does that, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How I, much time, I mean, how much effort does that take? So, it feels like a conference presentation. Yeah. So we record once a week and in the intervening time, I listen to many university level lectures. So NIH has a, um, a bank of lectures I have some sources of, of recorded university seminars. I'm trying to find the the points of intersection. So like for four episodes on sleep, it's not like I'm gonna just regurgitate a popular book or take one lecture and just you know poach the content. I'm gonna find the overlap in the different elements. I also, so what I'll do is I'll generally read 10 or 15 papers 
and generally those are good reviews, annual reviews, annual review of neuroscience, annual review of physiology, those kinds of things. I'll chase a few references. I'll listen to some YouTube videos, but of university level lectures. Mm -hmm. And then I throw all that on a whiteboard, usually while I work out in the morning, I'll just be working out. I have a gym <laughs> in my house and I'll uh, just put up all these random ideas. I wanna cover that, dreams, hallucination. And then I take that and I start eliminating, I draw lines between the common points of intersection. And then from that, I, I distill out an outline. And then I basically think about what I wanna say on my walks with my dog. And I bother a couple of people and blab to them. So I would say each podcast, I, yeah, I, I put in 10 to 15 hours at least of passive listening preparation and maybe five or six of active preparation. So I, I do prepare quite a lot, but it has a certain reward component for me. I To come up at the end with something that's somewhat crystallized for me is just so satisfying. It feel like there's something about my dopamine circuits that just love that. And uh, the, the only pain is that a year later, after I've talked about the stuff a bunch of times, it's so much more succinct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's life. You you know, at some point yes. you got to pull the trigger. Well, the, the uh, I don't know what you think, but for me, YouTube uh, is, uh, that's why I'm sad that Joe left YouTube. There's a archival nature to YouTube that's kind of magical. And so I'm really glad you're now, you're, you, you're uh, doing a lot of educational content on Instagram before, but now on doing this podcast thing on YouTube, I, it's like a, it's, you know, it's like Feynman lectures. Like, well, that's very no, no, I'm yeah, not saying archival, every podcast, right. but there will be, there you will have some pod, I could already tell there'll be some lectures w which are like definitive, like really that's special the, ones. That's the hope. And mm -hmm. the, there's some aspect that's archival to YouTube where at least I hope like 20 years from now, some kid is gonna watch uh, watch a lecture of yours, and um, you know it'll it'll create the next Nobel Prize, right? It'll create it'll create another uh, you know a dream that then becomes a reality, and that that's a that's a special thing that um, that YouTube provides. So I'm really excited that you're on YouTube, and at the same time, I'm excited to see where this thing goes because um, it seems like change is the uh, the cliche thing. The change is the only constant in these times because you're paving uh, with this podcast, with this creativity, what you were doing on Instagram as well, you're paving the new era of what it means to do science. So actively doing research and actively explaining that research in new media. It's it's very interesting. Well, to inspired see. and genuinely inspired by you. We We had this discussion last time after the podcast recording and it was, it's clear that communication of science cannot be left to the, the existing institutions. And I'm not talking about universities. I just mean that the science section of newspapers is, sometimes there's some gems there, but generally it goes, you know, and I think you really have to know a field in yeah. order to extract the best things from that field. And my hope is that other practicing scientists and people finishing their PhD and postdoc and people who are running labs or working at companies will start to do this. I mean, how amazing would it be, for instance, if, if someone at, Neuralink was giving us hints about not necessarily what they're developing, because that's complicated for all sorts of reasons, but would talk to us about what the real challenges of building futuristic brain machine interface are like and, and what the what it means to understand a clinical problem and address it. I mean, I my hope is somebody there might eventually do that, that somebody in the world of um, chemistry or synthetic materials or whatever it is, we'll do this in a way that I could understand because I don't have expertise in those. I mm -hmm. think it would be marvelous. And um, you were tip of the spear, you were out first. And um, I'm just uh, happily trying to to move along in the direction I'm going. But I, I think the future of science education is online. And, and I think that's gonna be scary to a lot of existing institutions, but it's not about disrupting anything. It's just about trying to do things better. Yeah.